Good evening, everyone. I'm Gary Witherspoon, Deputy Project Director for the Public Outreach Sector of the Purple Line. On behalf of Governor Larry Hogan, Transportation Secretary Gregory Slater, and Maryland Transit Administration Administrator Kevin Quinn, welcome to the eighth Community Advisory Team meeting for the Uni University Boulevard area. Due to ongoing COVID restrictions, we are trying the Teams format this time out. It's a little different and we hope easier to use than last time. Please bear with us as we navigate this round of live public meetings. And when you are talking, please make sure your phones are muted. This evening's presentation is being recorded, so you'll be able to find it later on our website, purplelinemd.com. That's purplelinemd.com. Along with responses to questions we could either not answer or could not get to tonight. Next slide, please. Tonight, project leaders will introduce themselves and we'll go over ground rules for the meeting. We'll discuss project status, the light rail vehicles, get a construction update, and we'll tell you how to stay up to date on the project. Then we'll open the floor to questions. Here are our project leaders. Next slide, please. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good grief. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm Matt Pollack, the Executive Director for Transit Development and Delivery, and I am responsible for delivering the Pur Purple Line. Uh, next, I am pleased to introduce the Purple Line's Project Director, Vern Hartsock. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Matt, and uh, good evening, everyone. Again, I'm Vern Hartsock, Project Director. I'm responsible for the design, construction, and operations of the Purple Line. And I'll now introduce Anita Rogers, who has uh, recently received a very well-deserved promotion to become the newest member of our senior leadership team. Anita? Are you muted, Anita? My apologies. Good evening, everyone. As Vern said, I am the acting Deputy Project Director and Contracting Officer for the MDOT MTA. I've been with MTA approximately six years, and of those six years, I've been with the Purple Line since 2017. I am responsible for contracting, project controls, project administration, and diversity and inclusion. In addition to that, I have a really great team that is supporting me, and I look forward to um, taking this project to completion. Back to you, Gary. Now for some ground rules. Next slide, please. We ask that everyone is treated courteously and with respect. No rude comments, please. Everyone should feel welcome to participate. Please hold your questions until the end of the meeting and take turns one at a time. Wait to be called on to ask a question. Please raise your hand using the icon on your screen and we will accept questions and comments first from CAT members and elected officials, and then we will open it to the general public. All participants' lines will be muted until we open up the Q&A part of the meeting. The chat, the chat function will be monitored during the meeting, so you can also type in your questions. Next slide, please. We'll cover the segment of the purple line that includes the following stations, Tacoma Langley, Riggs Road and Adelphi Road, UMGC, UMD. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Project D Deputy Director Anita Rogers. As Vern said, Anita is the newest addition to project leadership, but she has served in the background on the financial side of things for a few years. You might have seen her letters cited in the Washington Post. Collectively, Matt, Vern, and Anita represent the new leaders of the Office of Transit Development and Delivery, which oversees the project for the MDOT MTA. Here's Anita. Hello again. 
This is Anita. Um, I would like to go over a brief um, synopsis of where we are and provide you a project update. As far as the settlement agreement is concerned, we were approved by the Board of Public Works and the Purple Line Transit Partners has started this procurement process to re-solicit the project so that we can get a new design build contractor. MDOT MTA jointly with PLTP will have a final approval over the selected replacement design builder contractor. In addition to that, we will continue to manage and advance the construction during this um, interim period. I also just want to let you know that, you know, over the last six months, we've been very busy and we want to bring you an update on the progress that we have made to get a new design build contractor on board. Next slide, please. In January, our concessionaire, Purple Line Transit Partners, issued a request for qualifications to several firms that previously expressed interest in working on the Purple Line. In March of this year, PLTP received qualifications from a number of firms and wilted that number down to three qualified design build teams. Those teams consist of who received the request for the proposals consist of first, our Maryland Transit Solutions, who is com comprised of Dragados USA and OHL USA. Our second team is Homar International. And finally, our third team is Tudor Perini, Linda, which is a joint venture. Now, these three proposal teams are currently reviewing documents, they're asking questions, they're conducting site visits, they're performing due diligence and to evaluate the project. And at the request of these three proposal teams, the state along with PLTP have mutually agreed to extend the solicitation period by 60 days. And this will allow the teams more time to price the work going forward in a thoughtful and competitive manner. With so much existing information to absorb, this additional time will allow the teams to go deeper into the data, reduce their risk, provide the best value to the state, and ensure a successful project restart. Next slide, please. And before we go on, I also wanted to let you know that in us um, selecting the, the, the firm with the best value, we will do that process. And once we do that, we will um, submit this to the Board of Public Works. Our next slide will be um, held by Vern, who he will discuss our MTA's management of manufacturing and construction. Vern? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. Um, to start with, um, I'm going to give an update on the light rail vehicles. Now, M.MTA has been working very closely with uh, the vehicle manufacturer, CAF, to progress the production of the vehicles. Now, I'll say that each light rail vehicle, is, it's actually one of the longest light rail vehicles in North America. It's 140 feet long, and it's made of five what's called car shells. Now, the car shells are manufactured in Spain. They're painted there, and then they're shipped to Elmira, New York where they're populated with electromechanical equipment, joined together, tested for safety, and the result is, is absolutely stupendous. I virtually attended what's called a first article inspection of the first fully completed light rail vehicle, and it is just absolutely um, amazing. And a little bit of uh, production status update on those car shells. Well, all 130 of them uh, to build the entire fleet of 26 vehicles has been fabricated, 94 of them, have been painted. 82 are in Elmira, New York for assembly. Uh, five are in transit from Spain to Elmira, and seven are awaiting shipment from Spain. The, the vehicle is magnificent. Next slide, please. Now, let me mention first, before I talk about the work that we've been doing over the past six months, that when, when building a new light rail system, the first order of business is utility relocations. Since the, the light rail system needs to bury a variety of infrastructure in the ground, which, which includes duct banks, conduits, cable trays, uh, electrical cables power for power and communications and, and railroad train signaling, uh, as, as well as we have to apply sub ballast, drainage meeting, media ballast, catenary poles uh, and retaining walls. Since we need to do all those construction elements, we have to we have to get out of the way any utilities that are obstructing us. So uh, that's our 
have been our, our primary focus over the last six months. We have been uh, focusing on both the underground and overhead utility relocations, working with uh, utility partners such as WSSC with waterline and sewer work, uh, PEPCO with uh, overhead and underground electrical services, and Washington Gas for, for natural gas services. And uh, <clears throat> one of the interesting utility relocations that's my favorite is steam lines. At the University of Maryland, there are 100-year-old infrastructure of steam lines that are being relocated. And the relocations will continue throughout the end of this year. In addition to that, the we're going to undergo the, we, we've been working on the condition, continued construction of the Northwest Branch Bridge for the light rail vehicle, uh, including the, for the vehicular, the vehicular traffic, including the duck, the uh, deck work and the retaining walls. And we've also completed the Adelphi Plaza entrance uh, construction that I'll show you a photo shortly. Next slide, please. Here are some progress photos to show the work that we've done. Uh, on the left, we have a deck pour on the Northwest Branch Bridge, and I want to bring to your attention the, the appearance of the broom. You've heard the term broom finished concrete. Well, that's achieved using a broom, and I, I think concrete work is, is amazing. It's an amazing skill and craft to see it well done, and waterproofing is being shown on the right of the picture here. Next slide, please. Here we see in this photo underground utility relocations on University Boulevard. As I spoke of, we have electrical, water, sewer, gas, utility relocations that are being done in this case on the University Boulevard as seen in this photos here. Next slide. And here we have the uh, Delphi Plaza reconstructed entrance to the uh, to the shopping center here. It looks absolutely amazing. Uh, next slide, please. Now, to give uh, insight on our six months look ahead of what we plan to do, we're going to continue our your, your utility relocations, again, involving our utility partners, WSSC, Pepco, Washington Gas, and Verizon, to name a few. Also, the uh, traffic on the Northwest Branch Bridge is going to be switched over to the westbound bridge, and, and the eastbound bridge will be closed at that time. In addition, we're going to continue work with sidewalks, gutters, storm drain installation, driveway connections, and roadway widening, widening from Temple Street to West Park Drive on University Boulevard. I'll now turn the presentation back over to Gary Witherspoon. Thank you. Thank you, Vern. As, you, as you've seen out there, we are working very hard, as Vern indicated, and our typical day shift will run from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m a typical night shift from 7 p.m. to 4.30 a.m. when necessary. Our makeup and maintenance days will be Saturdays as required. You'll see notifications for all work zones and hours in which work will be conducted along with any lane closures needed posted on purplelinemd.com. That's purplelinemd.com. Next slide, please. You should know that existing traffic patterns will change as work occurs as needed and that work may occur on both sides of the road and across roadways. When a lane closure is required, a notice will be distributed via text and email, but you have to sign up through purplelinemd.com. Just go to our website and you can sign up there for alerts. Throughout our work sites, you may see orange cones and barrels, which will serve as temporary barricades. And you'll see flag persons when required to direct traffic. We ask you to be especially careful around our construction sites. Pedestrian safety is paramount, as is the safety of our workers. We want everyone to make it home safely every day. Safety, after all, is our number one priority. Finally, because underground utility work is ongoing, you may see temporary road plates in place. Please be careful when driving or walking over those. Next slide, please. Now, the MDOT MTA recently established a business engagement team in the Purple Line Project Management Office to foster relationships with those businesses along the alignment that may be impacted by the project. 
The team consists of Shaquana Shields, Marlene Veris, the business management officer for Prince George's County, and Min Deep, the business engagement officer for Montgomery County. You see their contact information here, and you'll find it on the website. I also want to acknowledge the outreach team members who help arrange these meetings and prepare these presentations. Outreach manager Lauren Garrett, Leslie Leith, our senior liaison from Montgomery County, Julio Cerrone, our digital engagement liaison, and welcome to the team Genesis Baez, the new liaison for Prince George's County. Running tonight's presentation is Chris Stokes, who leads the project's photo and video efforts. We are grateful for their work and production. Next slide, please. Again, you can sign up for construction notices at purplelinemd.com. For project questions and comments, contact the Outreach Department. That's us at outreach at purplelinemd.com. Outreach at purplelinemd.com. Or you can call us at 443-451-3706. That's for English or for Spanish at 443-451-3706. 3705. We're manning our hotlines, so someone will be available to take your calls around the clock. Just call us and someone will get back to you ASAP. Next slide, please. This concludes our CAT presentation. Now, Matt will address those questions that came in before the meeting. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> uh, we got four questions ahead of the meeting, and so I'm going to go through them and, and discuss them. So first question, President Biden and the Secretary of Transportation are both big fans of trains. Is there any effort underfoot to have either of them tour the Purple Line site and express their enthusiasm for the project? Well, uh, MTA's Administrator Kevin Quinn has already met personally with Transportation Secretary Pete uh, Buttigieg, who has shared his unequivocal support for public transportation infrastructure and major projects such as the Purple Line. President Biden and Secretary Buttigieg have open invitations to visit and share their tremendous enthusiasm for the project. Uh, we'd love it and we look forward to our national leaders rocking the light rail line. Next question. Uh, did the Purple Line, let me just make sure I copied them all right. Yes. Did, uh oh, did the Purple Line gain any needed additional funding with the passage of the American Recovery Act or the previous coronavirus relief bills? Well, as you know, since its inception, the Purple Line has had federal financial support. In August of 2017 in Glenridge, Governor Larry Hogan and Secretary of Transportation Elaine Chao signed a $900 million full funding grant agreement, locking in the federal dollars for the project. That funding remains intact. Uh, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 uh, apportioned an additional $106 million for the Purple Line. Next question. When do we think tracks will begin being laid down? Are they already in some places? And when do we think we'll expect peak construction um, between New Hampshire Avenue and Riggs uh, on University Boulevard? Well, uh, some tracks are already in place near the Glen Ridge Operations and Maintenance Facility and near the College Park Metro Station. Uh, the timetable for peak construction between New Hampshire Avenue and Rig Road, Riggs Road uh, will be determined in coordination with the new design build contractor uh, who will be selected in the coming months. Uh, next question. Is there any concern on the part of Maryland that the proposed maglev train would divert funding needed for the Purple Line? Well, actually there is not a concern on the part of Maryland that the proposed maglev train would divert funding needed for the Purple Line. So thank you. Uh, back to you, Gary. All right. Before we open the floor up to questions, I'd like to acknowledge Vic Weisberg, 
the Prince George's liaison to the project. Uh, Vic, uh, is there anything you want to offer? Uh, not specifically, but um, it's good to see uh, everybody uh, out there and pro the, the project uh, moving forward. Um, you know, as usual, just want to encourage, um, you know, every uh, emphasis on uh, pedestrian safety uh, with particular interest in the Maryland 193 University Boulevard corridor is that unfortunately has the um, highest pedestrian crashes uh, in the state and um, making sure that this project makes that corridor, not just holding it harmless, but making it safer is very important. That and just continued outreach like like this meeting and um, and any any additional uh, outreach with the business community and the community as a whole. And um, um, overall, keep up the good work. Thanks. Are there any other are there any elected officials with us tonight? Yes, there are. We have uh, Delegate Moon. Delegate Moon, would you like to address the meeting? Uh, ha, I'm actually here just uh, lurking to, to hear myself um, what the restart looks like. So uh, thanks for uh, jumping on. And I see um, Talisha Searcy from uh, the City Council just uh, joins too. So look forward to this uh, getting back on. All right, Teresa. Talisha? Yes. Hello. Good evening. Do you have any words for the for the meeting? I'm sorry? Do you have any words for the meeting? Um, no, I just want to reiterate my appreciation for um, all of you all's um, time and attention to addressing the needs. Um, along the Purple Line route, specifically along um, University Boulevard. I know that we've gone on plenty of uh, walks and tours um, to try to address some of the um, construction related issues and um, definitely um, look forward to continuing to be able to work with you all um, as the project moves forward. So thank you so much for all of your time and, and responsiveness <laughs> to my pestering you. So thank you. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Now we're going to open the floor to uh, CAP members with questions. Please raise your hand so that we can acknowledge you. Then you should uh, unmute yourself by clicking on your microphone on your screen and fire away. If your question is not addressed tonight, don't worry. All questions will be addressed later in a question and response posting on the website. Similar questions will be combined, so you may not see your question posted verbatim. Uh, we'll take questions from CAP members. We invite you to turn your camera, raise your hand, and be acknowledged. Okay, let's see what we have here. You should also you can also uh, uh, type in your questions if you have them. Bear with me. I'm trying to see who is uh, who has their hand raised. Okay, Andrew Fellows. Um, hi, uh, thanks for having this uh, event. I, my question is pretty broad. Um, what does the team think is the big, biggest challenge going forward on University Boulevard for the Purple Line in the months going um, ahead? Um, and also, what's the biggest opportunity from the team's perspective? Wow, that is a broad question. <laughs> Well, certainly, um, you know, for us, the, the biggest challenge has been getting the utilities out of the way, uh, because certainly um, not only is it is it 
difficult work when you go underground and, and possibly find something that you weren't expecting. But but it, it's certainly never our intent to, to can you continue doing lots of, of construction that's disruptive to the neighborhoods. And certainly this um, this utility relocation is, is very disruptive because we're we're in travel lanes, you know, uh, continuously up and down the line. So so really um, the, the, the thing that we are going to be keeping an eye on is um, completing those utility relocations. Uh, what I mean by that is that um, we're, we have a certain amount of utility relocation that we're undertaking right now as the state, um, but we're not going to be able to get to all of it before our new uh, design built contractors on board. And from that point on, they're going to be doing some of their own utility relocation. So really, we, we just want to make sure um, that our contractor is fully cognizant of, of everything they need to do and they're they're reviewing everything right now and that they're prepared you know to go out there and and continue uh, in coordination with our utility work and and just get that work done um, so that uh, we can we can take the next steps um, which ultimately will be you know towards leaning uh, laying the the tracks along the corridor um, from from an opportunity standpoint, I, I I would say, and and maybe pass to Vic a little bit on this as well. But I think the opportunity is as we you know finish our construction. I believe that that the county is going to come in and and maybe do some some additional work um, beyond what what the scope is of the purple line, but but really to to re, to increase the the pedestrian friendly feel of the whole area. Um, but I think probably Vic might be a little bit better to talk on that side. Uh, certainly, Matt. Um, so the county, county is currently engaged um, in a uh, study looking at uh, bringing up to 30% design, um, a series of potential improvements in the Cool Spring Adelphi Road neighborhood. In fact, we have a uh, a community meeting um, on the 2nd of June, so just coming up. And um, uh, and I know the Park and Planning uh, has a similar study going on um, that actually connects to and is in concert to improvements that we're looking at in the Langley Park neighborhood that would connect to the Riggs Road uh, station our uh, sort of Adelphi Cool Springs um, plan is looking at connectivity to, you know, basically hand the ball off to uh, SHA and, and MTA to make the final connections. And we're, we're also, I know that um, council, uh, council member Tavares, um, along with um, park and planning, they are about to release a 30% uh, design plan for improvements, you know, actually in the uh, purple line right of way for a series of bicycle and pedestrian improvements. So we uh, hope that SHA and, and MTA, since it's uh, in in the right of way of of, uh, of SHA and, and the project will take the ball and uh, implement as much as possible. Thanks. Great answers and uh, nice to hear your voice, Vic. Thanks. All right, uh, Amy Hart has a couple of questions. Go ahead, Amy, fire away. Hi, I'm the cat member for the Chatham uh, Road neighborhood, and uh, we're very interested in everything that's going on. We're really excited about the study. Um, I'm looking forward to June 2nd to see the proposals on sidewalks or you know, whatever's gonna make it more pedestrian safe. Uh, in our neighborhood, connecting us to Maryland, University of Maryland would be great. Um, it's something that's extremely dangerous for us. Um, but aside from that, we just wanted to ask about the Purple Line project itself. The, the timeline that you have, I know it's going to be kind of a wag at this point since the contractor has not been identified, but if you could, you know, project like what, what could be the date and time of, of when everything would, would end, um, the construction would be done, the Purple Line's up and running. What, what year and season might that be, or just a year at least for us? We're just trying to manage expectations within our neighborhood. Well, Amy, that's a great question, <laughs> and and I, I wish I knew the answer. Um, and so so at this point, really, I I have to um, apologetically tell you that, that I don't have the answer. Um, but as far as as far as setting up the expectations, um, the the bids and proposals that we're going to be getting in later this summer, 
Um, we're not only uh, asking for a, a fixed price and you know an understanding of what their capabilities and plans are to finish. We're 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 asking um, our proposals to our proposers to provide us with a schedule. So so what that means is um, we're able to evaluate them both both on their their plan, their price, and their time frame. So when we do have a, a selected um, proposer. Uh, that we take to the Board of Public Works later, um, I guess in the in the fall, we we will not only be bringing to the Board of Public Works uh, a price and a name, but it will be a schedule, including you know the path to revenue service. So um, unfortunately, I have to um, pass on that answer for a couple months, be because we'll be getting you know um, these proposals in shortly. Okay, I understand. Um, just as a follow up as well, just uh, trying to understand the the noise factor as well is one of my questions in the chat. Um, just to get out of the way, is this going to be similar to the metro? Like when it goes above, um, you know, above at Lake Artemisia, for instance, is it going to be that loud of a metro? Those rail cars will they? What kind of noise will be generated when it passes? Yeah, and and that's a good question. Um, I expect that the light rail is going to be quieter than Metro uh, for a couple reasons. Um, the first, first reason is uh, a lot of, lot of Metro is on um, elevated guideway or, or elevated guideway, it's, it's up in the air. Uh, and so it, it's louder because it's, it's, um, it's causing vi you know, vibrations and generating noise through all of the, the metal structures. And so that in turn actually makes it a little louder where, where we're gonna be running mostly at street level, you know, at Northwest Branch, it is a bridge, but it's a it's a street level bridge, and, and any noise might might be projected more underneath the bridge than than above the bridge structure. Uh, the the other piece, um, and actually, Vern, I'll pass to you after I, I do this to see if you have anything else. Um, is is the uh, noise sometimes is a function of of speed, um, and so you have Metro um, operating at at higher speeds. Which, um, because because they they have no uh, traffic lights or anything um, in their way from station to station, so they're they're operating at a higher speed, um, closer to like 55 miles an hour, um, while you know our light rail could, um, if there was a an uninterrupted segment, uh, certainly not on University Boulevard, but other areas where there's uninterrupted, it, it can go as as high as 55 miles an hour, we're in generally going to be operating more at a uh, a street speed, if you will. So it's probably going to be closer to, I would say, you know, 35 miles an hour top speed along that corridor area. And and the slower speeds will result in lower noise. But I passed to Vern. He, he's pretty good at this stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. And I concur with, uh, with, with Matt, with your projection. Also, light rail cars typically are, by their nature, quieter than metro subway cars and one of the reasons for this is they have slightly difference in, in their suspension work uh, light rail vehicles are, are built to navigate through uh, kind of tight turns and so there there's flexible elements in their suspension that help to dampen the what would otherwise be uh, a projection of noise if the structure were more uh, rigid in nature and the lower speeds will relate will cause uh, less overall noise in general as as well. So uh, I think it's safe to say that that they are quite different animals, a metro subway vehicle and a light rail vehicle. And bear in mind that metro subway vehicles, you know, they're designed for exclusive right of way where you know, the public's not supposed to be anywhere near them. So, you know, they're, they're never really intended to be kind of quiet in a neighborhood because they're they're meant to have their own right of way. Light rail vehicles, however, share the right of way with pedestrians, vehicles, and in, in neighborhoods. So by nature, they are designed to operate uh, more quietly. And, and I think uh, that's what we'll find with uh, with our light rail vehicles in the Purple Line. That's a great question. Great, and, thank you. One other element that I forgot to mention, the trackway also is slightly different. Um, as a part of our mitigation of, of stray currents, there's a in many areas what's called a boot it's a, it's a rubber membrane that surrounds the, uh, the steel rail that also helps to dampen noise that's created as the steel wheels roll across the steel rails, uh, and that also helps. 
All right, we've got a comment from uh, Jeff Cronin who says, I appreciate the emphasis on pedestrian and biking safety. Great opportunity to address long time chronic problems, especially at Langley Park. Uh, next, I'm going to ask uh, Jonathan Caballero if he would ask his question. Absolutely. Um, hi, my name is Jonathan Caballero and I work with the Northern Gateway CDC that works here in, in Langley Park as well. And I'm also a resident of Langley Park. Um, I, I did have a question to see if with the utility relocation, there was any consideration of bearing the power lines uh, along University Boulevard. I don't know if it's already too late. I, I think there's already like new poles in place. Um, yeah, I guess that, that's my main question. Um, I, I am going to actually um, ask one of our construction folks, uh, Kevin Oberheim, to, to talk about that, or at least to, to see if, if he has a, a better answer than if, than if I tried to answer it. Sure, thanks, Matt. Um, unfortunately, we are at the final stages of our power line relocation. Um, you've seen, um, like you mentioned, the, the new poles that are in. Um, most of the old poles have been, um, the electric lines have been removed and we're in the process of starting to line up the, the communication lines to be moved. So in some places, those lines have already started to move and then, uh, but essentially up and down University Boulevard, all of the new power lines are already installed and hooked up to you know building services, uh, ho residential and, and business sir, uh, power connections have already been transferred. Uh, there are some underground uh, electric relocations in in certain areas, but predominantly the uh, the overhead lines are going to remain. And and like I said, we're we're at the final stages of wrapping that work up this summer. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. That's unfortunate. Was that ever like considered, or that was never something that was possible? I honestly don't know. That would predate my time on the project. Um, that goes way back to the planning stages. All right. Thank you. Okay, are there other questions? We Raise have a hand. hand raised. Okay. Fire away. Kaylee. Yeah, hi there. Um, I, I can follow up on this separately offline, but just in case there's someone at this meeting uh, who it might be good to put this in front of, um, and since we're talking about the utility pole replacements and relocations, we have had an issue with our um, banners that we have on the on the um, utility poles in the Tacoma Langley crossroads to, you know, uh, to highlight the commercial district. And they are uh, disappearing or magically getting moved. <laughs> and so I, you know, um, if they get moved, that's one thing to a, a shiny new pole. Um, but we've we've definitely lost a couple, and that that is a problem. And um, you know, I just would like to create a pathway with you know we we actually have a lot of infrastructure in the right of way, um, and we're you know happy to work with Purple Line, excited about this project. But um, we just want a smoother pathway for you know just keeping track of all all our stuff. <laughs> Kayla, are you talking about the purple line banners that are that have been placed along the project? No, nope. Um, we have our own Tacoma Langley Crossroads banners with pictures of business owners and the logo of the commercial district all up and down University and New Hampshire. Uh, you know, and it is it is possible that uh, something I don't know. I, I don't know if there's a variety of things that could have happened, but I'm just guessing with this work going on, it makes sense that that would be what happened. And we've also seen that some of them moved to the new poles, which is, is fine. And that's definitely part of the project. So. Well, I know that we're in the process of replacing the old signs uh, that uh, were put up by the purple line. Uh, but can I, any of you speak to the, the banners that have been moved? Well, yeah, planet? let me, let me, talk to that. I think, you know, this this is exactly the type of forum where, where we appreciate you bringing it up. Um, I think what will be important is is getting a, a, a contact, you know, and our, our community outreach team will reach out to you and, and make sure we do have the, the communications going back and forth on it. Um, certainly, if, if we are um, impacting a poll that involved taking down, you know, one of the local banners or something, it, it 
was always our intent to put it back up. So we want to we want to we want to figure this out, right? We want to we want to find out um, whether we whether it was taken down before we got there, or whether we took it down and stored it, or or whether there's some some other reason that we're not aware about. Um, so this is good. We want us we do want to establish that communication um, and and figure out the past and the way forward too. So absolutely. Um, and you can either you can either contact us at the the outreach email or phone numbers, or you know you can you can give us your contact any any best way to to reach you. I'll I'll definitely do that, Matt. And um, you know I've been in contact with the outreach team um, consistently throughout the throughout the course of the of the years on this project. And the challenge is it's other contractors, you know, coming out and doing work, and that's where the message doesn't really seem to get to. It's not like you know, necessarily the outreach team is out, the ones out there and or yeah. yourself necessarily. So that's the that's the challenge we're having. But I I'll re uh, I will reopen the conversation. Oh, yeah. Our, our outreach team can be tenacious. They they they'll beat up on our construction team if there's <laughs> something going wrong. So let us know. Yeah. And you know how much I like being out of the office, Kaylee. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> All right. Other questions. Uh, as a reminder, uh, we will accept questions for a week until May 26th, and you can send them to outreach at purplelinemd.com, outreach at purplelinemd.com. So if there's an issue that was not addressed tonight, uh, we will uh, provide an answer to you on our posting. All right, do we have any other questions? Hi, this is Amy Hart again. Sorry, uh, I have one more. Uh, again, it's in the chat as well, but just about the sidewalk construction. So I don't know where the funds are, if it's county related or all purple line related on building sidewalks along the side of university, uh, where there is where it ends. The sidewalk normally ends um, around uh, before you as you approach the intersection of University and Delphi. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out. I know the county is might propose something along sidewalks along the perimeter of that area. And I just wanted to see if that would be county funds or Purple Line funds. Um, if there's an overlap in the county weights um, for the Purple Line to do the work, obviously they would want to save the money if it's already included in the Purple Line project. Um, so just wanted to ask that question, like what can we anticipate uh, just, just timing wise on the study results, construction, you know, coming out of the, that study results on pedestrian safety? Um, for for Adelphi Road and um, and Cool Springs and and Chatham Road area, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Um, and Kevin, I'm I'm going to pass back to you again. It, it and Amy, uh, make sure I'm I'm rephrasing it correctly. For Kevin, you know, if if you can sort of explain um, the type of sidewalk and intersection work we're doing as as we you know, are doing our utility relocations up and down the alignment. Maybe you can sort of give a give a feel for the for the areas that we we touch and what we leave behind. Sure. Um, well, during during this phase, while we have utility work ongoing uh, and and focus almost entirely on utility work, um, we are not you know not necessarily installing any any of the new or final sidewalk or, or traffic signal crossings. Um, unless they're absolutely needed as part of the utility work. Um, that work is is planned for the, the remainder of the Purple Line construction um, under the resolicitation. Um, but we are, we, we do have a responsibility to uh, replace any sidewalk that is removed due to utility work, um, patching up any, any sidewalk that is damaged, driveways, crosswalks, things like that. So um, if, if you see any sidewalk that has not been properly constructed, um, you know, we We'd be happy to to um, take care of that and and putting in those requests or those uh, raising those issues to our outreach team is the fastest way to get get our, our eyes on it if we miss something. So um, along University Boulevard, we will be changing the pedestrian path um, near the Northwest Branch Bridge um, as part of that traffic switch. When when traffic does get placed onto the new bridge deck, there will be a minor change to the pedestrian traffic pattern. It it will 
be similar to what we have now where where traffic or pedestrians cross the road um, just east of the archery range and then cross the bridge and then cross back at West Park. Um, the crossing will be uh, slightly shorter and a different slightly different alignment, but um, will be a similar uh, crossing pattern um, for the duration going forward. And and Kevin, that also extends into the intersections as well. You know, if we're if there is, you know, because I think we've done that in the past, you know, where, where one of our walks we saw that that it wasn't wasn't easy for a shopping cart to negotiate across the entire intersection. So we had to make some some changes in in that area. Yes, that's that's correct, Matt. OK. And if um, I can add a little bit, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the county um, you know, is is responsible for uh, you know maintenance and improvements along uh, county maintained roadways, and so we're looking at you know how we can improve connectivity from communities, um, taking you know taking things up to the you know the state right of way. So um, you know, and and actually, I'd like to recommend that maybe at the next uh, next cat meeting for this area to um, for the team to perhaps show the uh, design proposals for um, bicycle and pedestrian connectivity. Plus, we'll be in person, Vic. Yeah. <laughs> we oh, need to be okay. in person at wow. our next meeting, and so we can just lay plans out on the table. We can all look at them cool. together. Yeah. <laughs> in person, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vic. And Vic has provided a link to the uh, County's Vision Zero page. Uh, we can provide that for you if you'd like. Uh, and the state, and if I, I'll just add a little bit. And then, thank you, Gary. The state is also a Vision Zero uh, entity, and um, SHA has a program called Context Sensitive Design, um, which you know matches up the you know sort of the the typology of of the corridor uh, with sort of improvements that that tend to work best for uh, multimodal safety. Um, so we're working very closely with with SHA, with MTA, um, uh, you know, on on those initiatives. OK, thank you, Vic. Uh, we have another question from Andrew Fellows. Yeah, it, I mean, it's a quick question. Do we know when the next um, meeting of this uh, of the CAT team for this uh, for University Boulevard? And part of the reason I ask is just your thoughts about um, the most successful CAT teams of the whole Purple Line and like who, what's the best we can expect to accomplish out of our meetings going forward? Well, we generally have CAT meetings twice a year. Uh, we can anticipate that uh, we will have one uh, probably early winter. Uh, and, and hopefully there'll be some movement on the selection of the uh, uh, design builder by then. So uh, uh, we should have news on that front for the next round, but we'll certainly, we certainly plan to have one later this year. And I, I think, yeah, but uh, Andrew, one of the things that I think makes us most successful in these CAT meetings is, is if, if we can help um, the CAT members get a better understanding of, of, the, the the construction that's going to take place between now and the next cat meeting. So in a, so in other words, you know, um, a lot of times it's very tough. You just see stuff on the ground, and you 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 can't necessarily see how this is a path to completion. Um, and so it it makes it harder for for the community to understand what things are going on. So when when we're we're doing a you know a, a top notch job, it, it it'll be. Um, to the point where you not only understand it, but you you can explain it to others um, who, who may be reaching out to you as CAP members um, seeking to understand the purple line. OK, we have a question from Wanaka Fisher. Yes, can you guys hear me? Yes. Sure can. OK, perfect. Um, this is Delegate Wanika Fisher. I represent um, District 47B. I'm, you know, it's funny. I'm actually on um, University Boulevard and 23rd Avenue right now, turning to go <laughs> home and looking at exactly what we're talking about. 
Um, I wanted to, one, just thank all of you for all your hard work because I really appreciate it and, and Gary, everything you do. I just um, had two questions and one's a follow-up of, of the last conversation. You know, I think one of the things, I mean, you might have talked about it. I'm sorry, I couldn't log on earlier, um, is, you know, during the, the construction, um, the best way we can to keep the community looking clean and, like, nice. Like, right now, I'm at 23rd and University of Lily sitting here and it's like, you know, the orange fencing is down, the signs are on the floor, there's a, you know, there's a couple of the cones over, there's some lining tied to the to the pole line. And I think like my constituents and my neighbors, because I live in the neighborhood right here, um, you know, get frustrated throughout that. So I think if there's any of a better way on like how it looks and things that are stored on the actual roadway or the side streets, I mean, the side areas um, during construction. And then how can we expect, so that was my first question. And then my second question just is, you know, is there a way for us, and I think Delegate Moon's also on this call, um, for us to sort of get notified when bigger, when big changes are happening so that we can notify our community um, through our social media and our sort of um, constituents that look to us for information, if there's a better way and a more for these meetings, um, and I guess the big ticket items um, would be good. So those are my two things, and just thank you again for all that all of you do. Gary, you want to talk a little bit about, about sure. the notification? Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that it always helps to, to document what you see out there. So please uh, stop, take a picture, and send it to us so we can see what you're seeing. Oh, uh, oh I did. I'm going to send it to you after the call. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That, that really helps. Also, in terms of notifications, we send them out uh, uh, at least a week in advance. Uh, hopefully, we try to send them out at least a week in advance so that we can let folks know uh, when things are happening in their communities and along their streets. Uh, the bigger ticket items uh, uh, you're referring to, I believe, will things that are that will happen later, and we will uh, try to give you a heads up uh, when something major is occurring. Uh, it may not be uh, uh, doable all the time, but we will try to keep you at uh, abreast of things that are coming down the line. And and just to add on to what Gary's saying, I think, well, first of all, certainly we want our we want our construction sites to be neat, neat and clean. Certainly, um, you know, it, it's one thing if if it's just uh, someone walking away for an hour to grab lunch in their middle of construction. But, it you know, if a, a construction site is 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 partially complete or you know in, in a state where there's going to be some time in between activities we we want it to look like it's it is a has been left in a condition that that is worthy of of the neighborhood so please please um continue to, to contact us and and hold us accountable to that so that's a good thing um with respect to the to the notifications um i i do want to to say that it, you raise an interesting point, delegate. Um, right now, typically we send out notifications as um, what we see as, as changing traffic patterns or or impacting you know pedestrian uh, movement, and and so that that tends to drive our notifications. If if you think of some other areas where maybe we need to to add a new category of notification or something. I think it's something that that we would be willing to look at. I don't I don't necessarily in my head this minute picture what that what that is, but but you or your constituents may have an idea of, of other types of, of notifications that might be worthwhile and we're happy to take a look at that. OK, we have a question. Yeah. Oh, thank you, uh, delegate, by the way. And, and yeah. please, please encourage your constituents to continue to sign up for notifications through the website. Uh, we have a question. From, hold on. Uh, uh, let's see, another thing came in. Okay, it disappeared from my screen. 
Uh, John, Jeff Cronin asks uh, if they can, if folks can know uh, who is on the CAT for this area. Uh, we have a list of CAT members that, we, but we do not publicly distribute it because some folks have privacy concerns. Uh, you can uh, probably uh, determine who is on your panel by attending the meetings, and you'll see the folks who are there. But we generally do not distribute the information because folks. Uh, would like to keep their information private. Amy asks about renderings of the plans. Yeah, but, um, we have certainly we have the the construction drawings and the design drawings. Um, I believe we have uh, a set of of landscape plans, which which. Um, show sort of a, a rendering of what um, sections look like. I'm going to see if if maybe Lauren on the on the call re recalls. I don't remember whether the landscape plans were just for station areas or if they extended across the alignment. Do you happen to remember Lauren? Hi there, I do. Um, okay. so the renderings are alignment wide. They are not 100% final. There have still been a few minor tweaks since then. They do not dictate crosswalks and that kind of thing. We also did renderings of each station, but I don't think we have any plans of actually rendering the intersections to the point of being able to see crosswalks and, and stuff like that. Um, some of the plans are still not 100% final, um, so things will be changing along the way and um, so our intent is just to render the big things like what to expect at the future stations and then on those landscape plans just just to show overall what the alignment will look like landscaping wise yeah so and and so i guess to add on that amy we we have plans that that show all the maintenance of traffic and sidewalks and crosswalks i i personally think they're messy um but but certainly, you know, we're happy if if you want to, you know, make a request. We're happy to to share those those drawings. Unfortunately, they're at an engineering level as opposed to more like a rendering level. Matt, I'll chime in too. Back um, when we were still doing in-person meetings pre-COVID, we often brought those with us. So I know at a, quite a few CAT meetings, we did walk um, folks through them. Um, yeah. Amy. If I recall, I think we sat down with Joe and did that in the past too, but I do understand the genesis of your question. You want to see what it's going to look like when you're out there on the street. I know looking at these plans are quite hard to understand um, when you're not an engineer and there's so much on there and it's so busy. It doesn't translate to real life, I'll say. Um, so I do understand the ask. I just don't know that we'll be able to, to change that at this point. Sure, and it's actually for communication purposes as well. I mean, I can read the plan and it's 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 detailed, but I, I'm not exactly sure where things line up with, I don't have landmarks basically based on distances. I you know haven't fully mapped it, like how close it is to a certain staircase that we have to our neighborhood. So um, a rendering would really help all of our neighbors just really get a, a better feel for it and and bring it, bring like more buy-in honestly. Like we just wanna make sure that we're happy. We don't want you guys to get more questions and of frustrated, you know, neighbors. Um, so yeah, I mean, th I think renderings would help if if it's something that can be arranged, um, especially when we have another year until construction actually starts again. Um, is how it seems, at least. Uh, yeah, and, and beyond that too, it's just that it's going to be a long time until work starts again, and and we have um, we. We just have a list of, of things just like the, the picture that came through of just kind of left projects that um, it, it's just it's another year of in transition and we would like to we like to get some more, um, you know, hope basically inject some hope into our, our neighborhood. But. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your questions tonight. Uh, that concludes our cat meeting for this evening. Uh, you, have an, you have another week until the 26th to send questions to outreach at purplelinemd.com. 
outreach at purplelinemd.com. If your question wasn't addressed tonight, you should look forward in our posting on our website, along with it, along with tonight's presentation. Uh, Matt, do you have any departing words? Um, other than thank you all for 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 taking part in this. Um, this this format worked a lot better than than in the fall where we were trying to do it more as a as a webinar that we hit some tef technical difficulties and I apologize for that. Um, you all are the, one of the most polite polite video conference <laughs> I've been on in months. So I really I really appreciate all of you all too. So um, you know thank you for that and and uh, I'm serious. Uh, our next meeting. Uh, I, I cannot see a, a reason why we will not be in person. So I'm looking forward to that. Okay, thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.